for uh, and just tell us just interrupt me whenever you're ready tony yep. um so i have been discussing um rule of law thinking about it for 30 years or 40 years my entire adult life i've been thinking about the rule of law but i think i'm unusual i think very few people think through it and i and I wanted to almost have a whole outline, like a course curriculum of a half an hour discussion on the rule of law. And, um, and I opted not to, um, because I'm, I'm fairly well versed in this subject. And my guess is you are too. Um, uh, my instinct says that this is probably the most important thing we can be discussing as citizens right now in America, this little snapshot in time, We're that right the now. more people we can understand the rule of law, the better our republic will be. And for folks that believe in democracy, the better our democracy will be. And are we a republic or a democracy? I'll start. Looks like we're already recording. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and formally start. Uh, welcome, um, friends. Um, I love this conversation. I just think it's completely essential. And I think so many folks don't even understand the topic. Um, and so today, um, we've already hinted at this. This is our ninth series, our ninth discussion. Can you believe we've been doing it nine, nine times already, Professor? Yeah. Um, and we've hinted on the rule of law um, several times, particularly in our discussion on America and what it means to be a, an American. But in every topic we've talked so far, um, rule of law permeates our discussion. Um, because we'll, we'll, I'll ask you the question, since you're probably the expert, instead of me waxing poetic on it. Uh, but I do think it is, it, it's a wonderful thing for us to take and share the knowledge of how unique our system is and how absolutely essential it is to fight for that over specific issues. We can argue about specific issues all our lives, but unless we believe in the rule of law, none of those specific issues matter because then we're just going back to the rule of the bicep. And I know there's more articulate ways to describe what rule of law is not, but it's rule of force by whatever kind of um, means is necessary. So I'm John Brackney. I'm the uh, host um, today um, and uh, every, every Friday at 11 o'clock uh, Mountain. Um, and with us is Professor Tootle. Um, and Professor Tootle, why don't you give a, a, just a a minute or so background on, on who you are and then add another minute on your perspective of the rule of law. Uh, uh, Steve Tootle and I am uh, a professor of history um, involved in many uh, activities involving reading and writing and talking about history and political ideas. Um, and as far as uh, rule of law, um, I think you've already hit on the two most important things to understand. Number one, it's foundational. And number two, it only matters if you believe in it. So those two factors uh, are the foundation of all civil society and all human progress. Uh, yeah. All human progress, going from cave person days to the founding of America. Well, I, you know, I don't know. I assume you have questions you wanted to ask me, but I can I prove it in one chart if you want me to. Sure. Uh, I, I don't know. You want me? I can even, I can even do the thing where I share the screen here. Yeah, Tony. Um, I assume you can. Um, yeah. And uh, a shout, quick shout out to Tony Hodds, um, who is our IT expert. Eventually, he's going to get me a better camera. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't have the ability to share screen. Let I me just, uh, change that. So hold on just a second. Okay. But um, what? Oh, you should I, be able to now, Professor. Okay. Let's see here. I just want to show you just one quick chart um, that I use sometimes in class. And it's from this website called Our, Our World in Data. And um, this is world GDP for the past two millennia. And what you should know is that um, um, basically for all of human history, there, there was no wealth being created anywhere in the world. Um, wealth was ex essentially just changing hands based on violence. And um, then something happened. <laughs> And it wasn't 
the origination of the concept of rule of law, it was the application of the concept of rule of law. And what we see is that, you know, essentially uh, what happens is that countries begin adopting rule of law. And most of this wealth creation between 1000 and 1500 was just in one country, uh, just in England <laughs> after adopting rule of law. And we see what happens when you add the United States into the mix and you have the first wealth creation. And I would say that's really just for the most part happening in a handful of countries, basically the British um, 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 colonies and America. And then as other countries begin adopting rule of law, that's where you see actual wealth creation. And no matter what issue it is that you care about, um, if you care about human beings at all, <laughs> uh, this is a great website, it's just called Our World and Data, but let's say you care about poverty. Um, and you, you really care about human beings what you should note is that if you would like to eliminate global extreme poverty, what you really want is the expansion of rule of law. Uh, and that is the thing that leads to human flourishing. And um, uh, I mean, let me just find another super dramatic chart for you here that shows. So here's, here's what has happened to global poverty with the application of rule of law in um, new societies. And, and, and um, so going from a world where most of the world, 94% of the world was living in poverty to a world where 10% of the world is living in poverty and global extreme poverty goes from 84% down to 24%, that's largely because of the expansion of the concept of rule of law. So okay. no, no matter what issue it is that you care about, that is the foundational concept. So professor, this is a good time to do our um, intentionally gratuitous shout out to Arthur Brooks at the American Enterprise Institute who is a very successful CEO of the major conservative think tank in America, the American Enterprise Institute. And he, he stopped his CEO-ship after a decade and said he's gonna dedicate the rest of his life to um, bringing those remaining 2 billion people out of poverty. That capitalism and the free market, et cetera, rule of law has allowed us to do that drop that you demonstrated, but he doesn't think that's good enough. He thinks every, Amer every worldwide citizen should have that freedom um, to determine their own destiny, correct? Yeah, and, and you know what, I, I do have a couple of points of difference with um, with Arthur Brooks and not not in the concept or philosophy, but I just find that the, the words we use to describe these concepts tend to divide us. So it, it, I like rule of law, but I also just prefer to use the word peace. I mean, after all, uh, you know, people will imbue money with all kinds of power, and they'll say that money is this, is this, and money is that, and money is, uh, um, you know, they will anthropomorphize <laughs> money, but money is nothing more than a peaceful contract. It, it's, we're agreeing that this thing is worth this amount of money so that we can peacefully exchange um, um, value back and forth with one another. And, um, and, and so I try not to use the word capitalism because it, it was originally an insult, uh, you, meaning you are someone who believes in the myth that property exists. But if, and I, I prefer to just not buy into that at all and, and think of it in terms of, uh, well, um, I, I as a free person can determine what I will work for. And then once I have that stuff, 
if you want to take it away from me, you're either using violence or law <laughs> to, to do that. And I prefer peace. So instead of calling it capitalism, let's just call it uh, the peaceful exchange of goods and services. The, 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 or the peaceful way that society can conduct itself. I well, mean, I, oh, go ahead. I, was, I have another well, metaphor for you, but. Uh, go ahead, your, your okay. metaphors are good. Well, I was just, an example I used to give in my classes is I would say, all right, let's divide the, and I would go through this whole elaborate thing because I'd like, I think jokes are funnier if they're longer and more confusing. And, um, so I'd go through this whole elaborate thing in class and I'd say, okay, you guys are going to be one football team and you guys are going to be other. And then we're going to, um, we're going to uh, go out in the quad and we're going to play a game of football. And I, and then I say, all right. And I get everybody believing that this is going to happen. And I say, okay, now what if we were to go out there and uh, uh, I say hike and then pull out a shotgun and shoot this student. <laughs> And they would, you know, this usually gets their attention. I say, I have introduced violence. I have broken the rules and we're not playing football anymore. The violence is what breaks the rules and the rules are not punishment. The rules are what make it possible to play the game. You know, we, when we, when we engage in sports, we don't, you might hate the rules if a call goes against you or something, or, or if they're applied uh, in a way that causes you to lose the game. But every sports fan knows that in order to have a game, you have to have rules. Otherwise, what you have is violence. And um, getting back to the founding, this is not just something... Um, uh, you know, last week we talked about the founders and the essential understanding of the founding, and we talked about American exceptionalism. But in Federalist One, Alexander Hamilton says, this is the key to understanding all human relationships. It's the important question in all of human history. Part of your job as an American and as a conservative is to understand that the question for all human interactions, for all social interactions between human beings is, can we be governed by reflection and choice or are we destined forever to live by accident and force? And I, I would even say another, another interesting way that can draw people into this conversation is to, to ask them about human biology and say, we now know, I always say like, uh, you know, our uh, modern science has finally caught up to Abraham Lincoln and Alexander Hamilton, um, because we know that there are parts of the brain that evolved at different times. And the, the, the parts of your brain that told you to want things <laughs> is an old part of your brain. The part of your brain that told you the, uh, to be angry, to react emotionally. These are all the old parts of your brain that are related to human survival. In other words, they're the parts of your brain that evolved when human beings were more like animals. <laughs> Fear-based and power-based. Yeah, but what about the other part of your brain? The most human part of your brain is the part of your brain that's capable of reflection and choice. And what rule of law does is it says, we are going to be governed by reflection, meaning we're gonna stop and we're going to think about this and we're going to then make a choice and that and i always think of it as uh, you know hamilton stating in federalist one we need to not use the animal part of our brain <laughs> when making decisions and we need to use the human part of our brain when we are making decisions and to say that this concept of rule of law is um simply those two parts that you already outlined, which is we are going to do this peacefully and we all have to believe in it. In order for the game to function, we all have to believe in the application of the rules. Otherwise, the game can't work. And the same is true so, of basketball and the and Constitution. I, I, I'm so glad you wanted to go into that analogy because it's just awesomely illustrative. Of, of what's happening in America 
right now. So you happen to mention conservative, but you actually mean conservative and liberal, right? Sure. I mean, sure. We, you and I may be conservatives and maybe some of our friends here are, but liberals do, or at least should, also believe in the rule of law just as equally as much as conservatives, correct? Yes, that is, that's one of the pluralist, I, as we said a few weeks ago, remember that in, in a pluralistic system, American conservatives and American liberals share all of the same principles, we just emphasize different ones over the others. So the, uh, in everything we say, we should always say that liberals believe all the same stuff just in a different order. Yeah, in the American, okay. so in the American sense. So, so let's, let's, boy, there's so many different ways to take this conversation. So friends, uh, be thinking of your questions and in about 10 or 15 minutes, we're gonna transition to your questions. So professor, I was gonna take us chronologically through the founding of our country again. Um, but I think this time I'd like to mix it up and talk about real life today, why this conversation is, is equally or more relevant um, than it, any time in the last maybe 100 years, um, 125 ish years. Um, so I see every day in newspapers and columnists and Facebook posts, uh, semi famous folks, uh, columnists and wags, political wags, and, and friends of mine who seem to not know it, but they have a, a disregard for the rule of law. They want to dominate either the liberals or the or the conservatives, or they think conservatives are fascists or liberals are communists, and they wanna dominate and stop them by any, well, by maybe any means necessary. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of give a, a current glimpse and use your history degree, uh, uh, your profession, please. Don't just be a, an opinionated columnist, but where we are currently in America, do you agree with that assessment that we're kind of gone astray here and we should slow down and back up or no, are things, are things just fine? Um, well, we, have a, we have a high problem and we have a medium problem and we have a low problem. Uh, so um, the, the low problem it, it, it is that we aren't teaching our children the, um, the importance of rule of law. Uh, and we are not doing that at the primary grades. And it, I always say that you know, everybody wants to do the, the sort of hierarchy of, of thinking or something. And no, nobody wants to ever do the low stuff. They always just want to skip to the high stuff. And I always think this is the same thing about everybody wants to think outside the box. But my argument is you have to learn the box first before you can think outside of it, because otherwise you're going to you're going to think you're inventing these concepts. No, other smart people have gone through this before. So learn what the smart people have said, <laughs> and then you're allowed to think outside the box once you learn the box. Um, and, um, and then I, I think that sort of medium problem is that we have now a 50 to 60 year crisis in education of um, teachers can't teach something that they don't know. And it's not the fault of the kids, and it's not even the fault of the teachers, and it's not the fault of the teachers' teachers, but the teachers' teachers' teachers are the ones who stopped teaching this stuff. We now have three generations of educators who have not, who do not know the basics of American civics. And um, we say to our teachers, hey, you need to go into the classroom and teach this stuff, but there's almost nobody around who, who even knows it anymore. Uh, and thus we get to the sort of high problem. And the high problem is what you were talking about, opinion, intellectuals, elites, professors, um, who for so long have been disdainful and get hired on the basis of their rejection of all classical liberalism. So the, when the left, and it wasn't, people will blame liberals in education. The problem is not the liberals in education. It was when the leftists kicked the liberals out. And of course, the, uh, you know, the, the conservatives were long gone. And, um, uh, but then you started having something even in some cases scarier and more dangerous to me, which is in the last five to 10 years, 
really since 2001, um, you've seen people who had previously been conservatives who abandon their conservatism and reject the American founding and say that, that no, there is a higher uh, principle and we can reject the principles of rule of law. And a, uh, I don't want to name names, but there's a prominent conservative think tank that, you, that used to be, uh, I mean, I think it's still on their masthead that they're supposed to care about the American founding. And the, don't guy, name names. the guy who's in charge of it doesn't seem to. Um, and uh, and it, it's, I mean, it's literally something that was founded to do the opposite of what it is currently doing. Um, and it's a real shame because it was such a great institution for so many years. Um, but now in those places, I couldn't get a job <laughs> because I believe in the American founding. So you, you have the rejection of the founding and what I would say is the, um, the basis of all civilization now being rejected by elites um, for many different reasons. And why is this a problem? Well, uh, because we are an ideological nation state. Uh, we talked about that in a previous episode too. We are uh, ideas, nation, government, people, <laughs> right? We, we, ideological ideas, uh, nation, people, <laughs> state, government. We are people who are held together by nothing but ideas. So what happens to a society that's held together by nothing but ideas when nobody knows what those ideas are anymore. Ah, man, there's so we could do a, well, you, you teach professionally. We could do a whole day on this. So I've only got seven minutes on this. So let me um, do some almost rapid fire things. I guess we should define our terms. We can all Google rule of law and, and which I did by the way, a few days ago for the first time in my life, I've usually gone to primary sources and read books but I decided to Google a few days. What does the rule of law, if a layman looks it up, what does it mean? And it, it kind of gives an idea. So do that on your own team. Professor, what does the rule of law mean? Rule of law means that, um, uh, well, I always, uh, I'll, I'll again go to history, that the great revolution in human history was when the English decided that society should be ordered as uh, God, law, king, instead of God, king, law. So uh, that you believe that there is an abstract version of truth out there and that the law is what governs our society, the application of peacefully agreed upon rules that reflect the values of society and the equal uh, application of those principles. Okay, so what are the, what's the opposite of rule of law? And I know violence. there's a lot of different answers. What's it? Violence. Violence. Yeah. The, I mean, all of human, for almost all of human history, violence guided every re human relationship. So the opposite of rule of law is violence. It, it, it is the rule of whoever is strongest imposes their will until someone stops them. Difficult question, try a short answer. How is it possible that both conservatives and liberals are arguing for the rule of law, no matter what they're arguing for, but they either don't know what it means or they don't care or they're being a manipulative? I, I don't mean to lead you, but, but I see it in the newspaper. We need to protect the rule of law. And the other side says the same thing. What's going on? Uh, we have too many short-term incentives. Uh, if you don't care about the long term, and I guess I would, I think this is, if you really want, if you're, if you're really asking for my personal opinion, I think it's a crisis of spirituality. I, I, I think that one of the things that people no longer think about is, am I going to hell? <laughs> you know, and, will I, my having your identity tied up into uh, believing in truth uh, makes you think about the long term. And what I see and what I fear are politicians who care only for the short term and thus 
when rule of law conflicts with your desired immediate result, you just simply embrace whatever gives you the desired immediate result. Um, and in other words, I mean, this was a big fight just last week between that aforementioned guy I won't mention and David French with the guy I won't mention essentially making the case that I don't care about the laws. It, this is what I want. <laughs> And you're like, well, that's, you're being a child, <laughs> you know, you're being or a king, yeah, or a king, or a bully, or, you know, but you're somebody who's saying, all I, you know, I don't care if somebody comes into the middle of that soccer match with a baseball bat, I all I want to see is that ball go through the net, <laughs> you know, like, I want to see the ball go into the net. And, yep. and I'm going to call that a win, even though we so were professor. Also, you didn't win, because that's not a soccer game anymore. One of the things that um, occurred to me as a, as a fairly young man um, is that the rule of law provided certainty. Now, I wasn't a business guy. I was in high school and college. But, it, but, but can I own a gun or not? Can I have an abortion or not? Can I discriminate or not? Can I, can I conduct my life in the manner that I wish to live my life? And, and I was taught very early on that in America... You don't have to guess. You don't have to go ask the mayor or the governor or the president whether you can do all those things and, and everything else we do in life. You can look at the written law. You can actually look it up, a state or a city ordinance, a county ordinance, a state law, a federal law, an executive action, an ex a federal department agency. Can I do what I want to do? Look it up. Don't ask somebody's opinion. Look it up. And what that did is provided certainty for us in our family life. Hey, if I have a bunch of children, will I get a certain amount of taxes so I can afford the home that I'm doing? Or will it change? Or can I found a business here and have this type of industry? Or can I, everything about life. That's what made America unique is that we have certainty that no matter who's in charge, whoever the king is, whoever's the president, governor, et cetera, it won't change unless there's processes involved. The legislature acts, the Supreme Court changes it. So why don't you take us a little bit through that in two minutes and then I'm gonna open it up. And I mean to kind of promote future shows, um, abortion, LGBTQ, um, uh, military, um, almost every imaginable action fits under that framework of the rule of law. Can we do it or not? Let's look what the law is. Can you give us your reaction to my comments? Well, at first I would just say, it doesn't necessarily provide you with certainty so much as it provides you with a peaceful mechanism for resolving differences. Because, um, uh, and it reminded me of a couple of elements. Number one, when, when do, first the law is supposed to be a reflection of our, of our values. And so when something happens in society that seems to conflict with our values, uh, it will, we will have the sense of outrage because it, it, we say, well, this does not approximate justice and we want our laws to approximate justice. And when it seems like the law is failing us, that's when you see people hitting the streets because they say, well, I need some way of saying the law has failed me. And I would say it provides us with a sense of certainty, but imagine a scenario where you're saying it provides us with certainty, meaning I can build an addition to my house. But what do you do if um, in the building of the, the city comes along and says, um, 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 no, I know the city code says this, but we're gonna make you do that. What would you do as a citizen? Well, would you throw a brick through a window or light something on fire? No, there's a, it provides you with a peaceful way of resolving this situation uh, by saying these laws are not being applied equally or fairly. Um, and I guess I'll just leave it at that because I, I and, and ask a, a follow-up question if you want. But I, well, let me my that. immediate reaction was just to, to, to say that it doesn't leave us with certainty. In a way, it leaves us with a peaceful way to resolve our uncertainty. Agreed with that. Agreed. You're right. But you're right. It, it, it sets what but, the rules are for day-to-day -day living. 
yeah. And, and better. Uh, there's the emotion, uh, instead of just the king, um, there is the emotion of the times where the mob rule can also be the king and take away private property rights or gun rights or voting rights, or I mean, you can just go all through the, the liberties uh, enshrined in our constitution. And what, what our rule of law system does is not provide absolute certainty, but it does provide timing certainty and, ti and plans, time to change and reevaluate your business plan or your life. Where in some countries, uh, a dictatorship takes over and boom, sorry, you're all your investment and all your livelihood. No, it's now you're not yours. It's our government. It belongs to the people. And that just really would be very difficult to do in America. Yes, it provides it because of our checks and balances. And so there are some things under rule of law. What does it actually mean? It means checks and balances, it levels and structures of government and independent judiciary. Um, um, uh, executive can only act under the parameters of the of congress it, it, and on and on and on and on that many or in fact most countries still don't have to this day so i'll end with that uh, agree or disagree agree and i would just add i always point out that um culture comes before all of these things though and that's why it's so important that we have to actually believe in this stuff because um there are a lot of countries out there that have good constitutions they just don't follow them Right. Ah, well, I, we're going to end with that uh, is our dialogue because it's already 1132 and I love to honor people that are, are willing to sign in with us weekly. And I know you like that as well too, Professor. So um, not every one of you has to ask a question. I'm lying. Every one of you should ask a question, um, including you, Tony. Um, did, did the professor and I give you enough handholds to you know, ask for some clarification or, or make your own point. Frank, you're up. All right. So it appears that the left and the right are both arguing f for the protection of the rule of law. And Go ahead and correct them already. No, 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 not left and right. Left and right hate rule of law. Liberals and conservatives. conservatives. Excuse, 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 excuse me. Yeah. I'm, I'm mis thank you. Thank you, uh, yeah. Professor Tootle. Um, but the reason why we're not uh, uh, engaging in the protection act or effectively is because we don't believe uh, our, our, we're, we're not worried about our souls. We're not worried about going to hell. We don't, uh, you said a, a lacking spirituality. And yet there is a, uh, we're in this country, we're moving away from uh, traditional religions. The percentage of people who are practicing traditional religions actively is going down and i'm uh, below 50 percent for the first time in in u.s history so, so so and so you hear everybody say oh we need to go to church and that would solve everything you know and and there's some truth in in, in that what might be the viable substitution for traditional religions that give us the same inspiration spiritual inspiration to care about the health of this uh, society and 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 the, the importance of protecting the rule of law. Uh, you know, what, character what, shaping institutions. Say it again. Practicing a character, practicing something, and involving yourself in a character shaping institution. Um, in other words, one of the other. I don't. I don't think that the. Um, I think that the church. What we described in church, is not. It, it, it doesn't have its origins in the church. It, it has its origin in the culture that will not participate in any character shaping institutions. And what we have now is a culture that too often rejects all character shaping institutions. In other words, uh, again, I, it doesn't, I could make it about my students or I could make it about the, the U.S. Marines or you could make it about your church, but Previously, um, students came to college and came to education with the idea that I'm coming here in order to have my character formed. And parents wanted their children to have their characters formed. And now what we have is too many people, again, I would say at the higher end of society, who 
are rejecting the idea of anyone shaping their character. Um, it, it's too easy to say. Um, I mean, if you look at the, uh, you don't just look, need to look at religion, look at participation in service clubs. Yeah. Go to your local Kiwanis and check the average age of your Lions, your Kiwanis, your Rotary, and um, uh, it, the acceptance, and, and it's largely because, I mean, I, one of the things that's most shocking among young people, there was some study that said, I wish I could remember the stat off the top of my head, I'll have to Google it later, but look at the percentage of young people who think that their career is going to be as a social media influencer. And if that number was 10%, it would be shocking, but it was something like 70%. And you're saying to yourself like, you honestly think that you're going to have as your career that the world is going to watch you? <laughs> like, and that's a, you think that's a, and the answer is yes. Uh, and um, I think that it boils down to what has saved America so many times. Sorry, now I'm on a rant, but I think about a moment of danger like the Great Depression. What was it? about Franklin Roosevelt that saved America at a time when, when we could have had a dictator? And the answer is Franklin Roosevelt didn't look up to dictators. Those weren't his heroes. He, he had the right heroes, which meant, oh my gosh, Jake Peterson, 86% of young people aspire to be social media influencers. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. That, is, that's, that, that should stop us all. We should all catch our breath when we see that. 86%? That's insane. <laughs> that is lunacy, all right? Okay. Uh, Go back to FDR, Professor. Yeah, back to FDR. So, uh, but, but you have to have the right heroes. Because if your hero is George Washington, when there's a crisis, you're going you're gonna to say, I want to be like George Washington. If your hero is Abraham Lincoln, in a moment of crisis, you're going to say, history will judge me by how close my actions were to what Abe Lincoln would have done. But if, you, if your hero is yourself, or you have no heroes, or you don't want to judge yourself on any universal standard of goodness, as most you know, religions would do, uh, or any character-shaping institution would do, then in a moment of crisis, you're going to follow your impulses rather than do the hard thing. Sorry for the long answer, but it's something I feel very passionately about. Yeah. Follow up, Frank. So how do we move from where we are to aspire to having most people in the country participating in character shaping institutions? So one small step. That's more my question than yours, Professor, but go ahead. I almost, I mean, I, I don't know how to unring this bell. Um, I know how, I mean, I've thought of it because I've thought about this for a long time, but um, I think that at the state level, American citizens at the state and county level, we've reached, I would say this is a crisis point where Americans at the state and county level need to look at civics education, actually look at it. And in particular, we need to have subject matter experts, people with PhDs in American political history, nothing else. <laughs> like like don't, none of these like, oh, I can do American politics. We, no, I want people with PhDs in American political history teaching American political history to every single teacher in America. Right now, the, we don't have anybody teaching American political history who is an expert in American political history. Uh, and you, if you want to check this out, um, I haven't looked lately, but you can go on the go on the websites of the flagship universities in your state and look at the um, expertise, go and look at their history department and then find out 
how many of those people have PhDs in American political history? And you might be shocked to know that there might be zero. <laughs> the answer might be zero. And if you say that, that means that no teacher in your state is learning about American political history from an expert in American political history. Not one. Now, what's that going to do after 60 years? <laughs> so so uh, thank you for that answer, Professor. And let me not contradict you, but add a different perspective. Frank, um, this is a cultural issue, as the professor has pointed out. And the way you solve cultural issues is not with legislation or regulation. It's with how we act on a daily basis. And if we want something different, we have to not click on clickbait. We have to not watch the, the television news that is exaggerating and enforcing on the left or the right. Ah, sorry, professor, conservative or liberal, whatever their agenda is. If there's something decent and thoughtful and kind and wonderful, we should applaud that instead of immediately switching back to the weird, the odd, the obscene, the nutty, and then go, everyone, come and come into my tent and look at the nutty thing going over here. Don't we hate this? And everybody gathers around and go, yes, we hate this. Uh, our, our elected officials are just a reflection of us. And I think this is a cultural uh, crisis that we have, that we as individuals have to solve it. And we can't solve it for all of America, we, but we can solve it in our neighborhood, in our little community, in our family. You know, we can we can make a really positive change in people's lives just by modeling consistently every day the behavior that we'd like to see. And this is not a show about me. Uh, I didn't mean to contradict your professor. I mean, no, I meant to I add to it. I mean, I was just thinking about the kind of ma macro level, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that everybody should get a paid subscription to the dispatch. It's ten dollars a month and get a paid subscription to the disc. I have no affiliation with this website. <laughs> I, I have nothing to do with them, but I would just say, this is a news organization that has said, we're gonna put original reporting first and fact checking, you know, and we're going to, uh, you know, kind of do it in a new way, but it's $10 a month. And I would just say, get a paid subscription to the, to the dispatch and, um, and read the dispatch first. <laughs> you can read everything else second, but just read them first uh, and get some original reporting first uh, from good reporters and, and then start forming your ideas and opinions. But, and you're right, absolutely. I mean, it's so hard though, because I mean, I have two kids that are in school and their dad is literally a history professor and my, their teachers are very nice people. They're good teachers, but they don't know anything about American history. Mm -hmm. They know nothing. My students, I, when I first started teaching, I first stepped into a classroom in 1997. And my, I first started teaching college in 1998. And I would say that my students used to have a liberal bias my students now have no bias. They come into my classroom knowing nothing. All the, if you ask my students anything about history, the only thing they can tell you is America is bad. <laughs> uh, slavery was, uh, was bad and we did it. Um, and um, that's basically it. <laughs> and America oppresses minorities. I mean, those are the only truths that my students come in to the classroom knowing. All right, um, Professor, we're going to double check that. I know you're up, Bart, but let's hold, let's go to Jake first. Jake, is it true the professor was your professor? Yeah. So um, Professor Tootle teaches in Ashland University's Master of Arts in American History and Government program, and I had him for a class on Contemporary America. Fantastic class. And what? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm giving you props here. But something that Professor Tootle's brought up is, you know, modern history departments, and I can speak from experience from my undergraduate, professors nowadays, they focus on race, class, and gender. Those are most of the history classes that, you know, you will, 
you'll take at a traditional history program. And so I, I'm unique in the sense that I've never been a history teacher before. I was, I'm working on trying to get a teaching job right now, but I wanted to do the MAG program first so that I would know the proper information before I started teaching. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of my, my colleagues in the program, my, my classmates, I guess, that these are people who have been teaching for like 20 plus years, some of them, and a lot of the information, like the primary source documents that Professor Toodle and the other professors bring to class, it is brand new information to them. And so like one class I took on the pre-Civil War era, there was someone who didn't understand how the, how the South was portraying the constitution, how they thought of it as a confederation and I, I had, I answered and I explained it in class, you know, what, like their perspective versus, you know, Lincoln and the Republicans. And they're like, I never knew this before. And it's like, if you didn't know something basic of how the constitution is set up and how the federal union is designed, what have you been teaching your students about it for the last 20 years? And so, I mean, I have friends that they've never been history majors in college or anything, but they just, you know, took the high school history class, took the college history class, and they're not even citing like Fox or CNN to me. They're saying there's some social media guy on Instagram that put up a video talking about something. That's what they're citing to me. They're not even citing a news outlet. They're citing some random person on social media is why such and such is a fact. And so I think that's scarier than just citing Fox News or CNN. If you're just citing some random person on the internet, it's like, well, what are their credentials? Agreed. Professor, retort to that or a response? I mean, it's my experience as well. And, I, and, and that's kind of why it's, if you think about the students we have at Ashland in the MAG program, these are often the best teachers in America who are doing the absolute right thing by going out and seeking out a program like the MAG program in order to, and many of them have been in the classroom for 10, 20 years. And, you're, and so if this is the best of the best who have never encountered what I would consider the basics of American history, what's it like for everybody? What's going on in every other classroom? If these are the best of the best of the ones who are seeking out self-improvement and seeking out information, on uh, you know traditional American you know political history, yeah, you know, what is it like in every other classroom? <laughs> yeah, and, and that seventy-five million versus eighty million people arguing on Facebook, <laughs> and and, and we 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 can do a lot better. We yeah. can do a lot better. Jake, did you make your point? And Professor, you responded. We're good. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, Councilman Miller, you're up. Okay, um, Professor Tootle, I'll um, also uh, say something good about the dispatch. I've been looking at it and listening to their podcast the last uh, several weeks, and it's fantastic. Um, you know, most of the commentators on there are probably somewhat more conservative than me, but I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, they're just very um, even handed in the way they approach analysis. So, a quick shout out to the dispatch. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> Well, I would yeah. say like their news reporting in particular is, is um, I mean, their commentary, you know, does ha have mostly conservatives, but uh, what I would say is traditional conservatives, mm -hmm. but, um, but especially in their news coverage is just excellent. Yeah, it's so fantastic. just a quick aside, my, uh, yeah. Councilman Miller, um, both Professor Tootle and I know David Goldberg and uh, we know several of the folks. Um, we should get a commission or something, or maybe they need to sponsor our show, <laughs> I know. Professor Tootle. So, <laughs> so excellent, Councilman Miller. Thank you for pointing this out that we're, uh, continue with your question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my, my question. Um, very simply, how can we start to ensure that our elected leaders at all levels of government have a respect for the rule of law? You know, right now, as an example, I can, probably say that there are, are <clears throat> excuse me, large numbers of delegations from entire states who are members of Congress right now, who really act as though they don't respect the rule of law. And I'll name a couple states. I think Texas is one of them. I think Arizona is one of them. Um, you know, when I listen to members of Congress from Texas, particularly Republicans speak about issues, I just sit there and go, Oh my God, 
why would a, an elected official at that level of our government speak about that issue in that manner? What can so, we do? Before, it's, yeah, go ahead. Before you answer, Professor, um, uh, it's been a personal mark that I try not to criticize specific individuals and look for the good rather than criticize the bad. Uh, I, I'm just pretty insistent on that, but Commissioner or Councilman Miller, I get your question, and and, and I, I wasn't sense. trying to single out anyone. I was just kind of right. So, Professor Tootle, how do we get that loyalty back to our system, to understanding what the proper means of complaint? or or even lawsuits are i mean how to and then decide well we lost how do we get that institutional loyalty back it, it, to being an american is that okay councilman miller yes i think that's a good way to put it you know i think that in in many ways the easiest thing is to take every single person who has an interest in this subject and go and run for your central committee for whatever either for the republican central committee or the democratic central committee and take over the party <laughs> because um, it, 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 you have no idea how easy it would be to do this. You know, you and 10 of your friends could control the political party in any city in America, <laughs> probably, uh, you know, depending on how the voting is structured in the districts and stuff like that. But, uh, uh, it, it, and there are people who are probably on there who, you know, and you just have to keep showing up to meetings and pretty soon they'll put you in charge. Okay, I love I love all that, Professor. But um, and as Bart, we've been friends a long time. That that's what I did. That's how a 29 year old John Brackney became a county commissioner. I'd call somebody up and they said, No, I don't. I like the old guy, the, the county chairman who I was running against. And I go, Okay, well, thank you very much. And then I called a friend of mine who lived in that neighborhood and had them show up to the caucus. And they kicked out that precinct leader to the county assembly and they voted for me. And the next thing I was the county comm commissioner and the county chairman was, I don't know, he's retired now. So yes, it is pretty easy with a little organizational adamacy. So what's your retort, Professor? I, as you know, I abandoned the Republican party four and a half years ago. You hate me for that? I, I know you're still a Republican. I am. Let's but, talk about rule of law under the context of rule of law. Yeah, but you know, I say this as um, I, I am no longer a member of the Central Committee, though. You know, in a, in a way, I, I was somebody who uh, I left for personal reasons uh, that were unrelated. But I, I will say it has been a relief to not be on the Central Committee. So you uh, just contradicted yourself. Sorry. Yeah. Now correct yourself or, or explain. Uh, but I think that if you are somebody who is in a position to be of service to your community, that that might that that maybe that is um, should be your first stop in your uh, journey to being of service. Because John, let's be honest, you accomplished a lot. <laughs> I can't think of any person. I mean, nobody else founded a city. You know, <laughs> nobody else I know of. Uh, so it, it it does it does work, and there's a lot of low hanging fruit. And once you do that, what you'd find is that you'd say to yourself, if I'm not in the room, if I hadn't been in the room, look at what would have happened. Hamilton. Yeah. You'll have a, a million of those moments where you just think, I don't think I know anything, but I'm so glad I was there to stop this from happening, you know, uh, or just to have this voice that ended up moderating the final result, even when you lose. I mean, Understanding the role of dissent and effective dissent is also important because even when you lose, you, you, the other side sharpens their arguments and at least understands uh, the things, the implications of their actions in ways that will often change their behavior if they're decent people. Yeah. And in a legal way, I like the word dissent, um, but in a political way, I prefer loyal opposition. Okay. Yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah, I mean, you, we're on the same team, but let's fight. Let, let's fight, but we don't hate it. We don't. We're not trying to kill each other. There may be people trying to kill each other, us, and we should figure that out. But let's not well, kill each I other. One, I had one way of working with Democrats that I, I mean, worked great for me, which is I always just said, "Do we want the same things? What do you want? You want fewer poor people? All right, me too." <laughs> so 
let's go down this list. And instead of arguing about the one thing we disagree on, let's pass the, uh, the 11 things we agree on first, and then we'll fight about this other one. <laughs> and what you find is, you know, there were 13 things you wanted to do and you accomplished 12 of them, you know, and let's call it a victory. Uh, and maybe you find that if you accomplish those other 11 things that maybe you didn't need to do those other two, <laughs> you know, like let's do what we can first. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, we only have five minutes left. Uh, professor, I know this is a little embarrassing. Your child's walk or not child, young adult has walked behind you before. I've got an elderly cat that I need to help. I know that's crazy. I am. I, yes, I'm a dog guy, but I have a cat. So forgive me. I'm going to be back in just a minute or two. Frank, do you, you're unmuted again. Did you have another question? No, no. Okay. Who's up? Ben or Tony? Or Eric. Tony, or jump away and, and forgive me if I'm not back in just a minute. Yeah, uh, no problem. Uh, so what I really appreciated about um, a little bit of what we were talking about is that those stats that Jake put up, you know, about the number of kids that thought they were going to be social media stars. It, it also kind of indicates uh, to us what uh, channel is open for these kids as far as education. So uh, I think what, what it requires of us is to think differently about how are we going to educate younger people coming up, you know, about history and things like that, that it's not only going to be in a classroom, it's going to be multimodal, you know, so that's what I was thinking about is there's some, there's some kind of uh, opportunity there too, you know, that we're going to have to think differently about the way that we educate people. Um, so th that was kind of what I was thinking about, Professor, when I, when we were talking about all those things, and maybe your perspective on that, you know, like, would well, be just getting people to understand using something that they like, I mean, they like sports to understand the rule, we need rules in sports. All right, well, we need rules in society, too. And so we have to be dedicated to the common set of rules first. And then we can peacefully play the game and decide who our winners and losers are. Uh, let's, uh, Miss Taylor has unmuted herself. Yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> Thank you for being patient with my camera being off. I told John I was moderating another Q and A at a wellness panel, and they didn't really need me very much, but they were texting me when they did. So. Thank you. I love this piece of the conversation around meeting the people that need the information where they are, meeting them on TikTok. So now I'm looking for your TikTok channel on history. It would be amazing. Um, you know how old we are, Eric? Eric, we can't do that. <laughs> All you have to do is show up. It's no different than showing up for a council meeting. All you have to do is show up on TikTok, say the exact same things that you're thinking that I look at how open and absorbing my kids are. They're hungry for it. We are not, this group is not the low, low hanging fruit. We all think everything. We are the smartest people in the room. You can't teach us anything. You can teach them everything. Huh. And you just have to do it. It's exactly what John or Tony, one of you just said, we have to be ready to do it where they are. Um, my kids are very sad that their teachers are not more ready to make some sort of tech mistakes hmm. and show up where they are because they want, they're hungry to hear. They're hungry to hear it hmm. is what I'm thinking. Comment or a question? So my question, is when does the TikTok channel start? <laughs> We're trying to figure out Facebook and Zoom. So all the ugliness in one place. I mean, I'm I'm kind of kidding and kind of not at the same time. I know. Okay. Well, uh, Eric, I think you're right on about like just a lot of this stuff is translatable into such a format. You know, there's ways to just cut it up and make it happen. And as uh, one of the things this has taught me, uh, behind the scenes uh, is that uh, I got, like you said, you have to be willing to make a lot of errors because I've made a lot of errors to get here to understand what we're doing. Uh, and, and even today when I was logging on, they had changed something about Zoom, blah, 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 blah. I was like, well, here we go again, you know, let's give this a try, you know? So uh, so I, I think you're right about that. And I, um, uh, I just think it'd be a really great little experiment for sure, you know, to start pushing that out. Well, now that we're nine weeks into figuring out Facebook and Zoom, uh, maybe we can add something else to our plate, Erica. Thank you. Professor, response to that? I would just say, you know, it's a little behind the scenes when uh, when 
John first approached me to do this, time is a finite resource. And so I said, I'll do this as long as I do no preparation. And that was literally the, I said, I will, you will roll out of bed and ask me whatever questions you want. And that's what this has to be because, you know, I have X number of hours in the week and I, I carve those up. And I said, I'm but you also have tenure, so you are harder to fire than the rest of us. Yeah, so. that's true. Yeah, I, I, do, I do have tenure. So, um, but uh, Erica, you can help us on this. So um, w Tony and I will chat and anybody else in the group that wants to figure out how to get our message out better. Because, um, yes, uh, I have an agenda. It's called freedom. Um, and Professor has a different uh, agenda and you all have your agenda. Um, and so let's figure out how to uh, spread the word adequately. We've already gone over. We haven't heard from and Ben. And my cat's screaming at me. Go ahead, Professor. I was going to say, we haven't heard from Ben yet. Yeah. Uh, happy to ask a quick round, though. It's got to be a quick question and quick answer. Ben. Uh, I really don't have a lot for this one around, other than uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I will share with everybody my definition of what an expert is, though. An expert sure. is someone who comes from far, far away and knows just a little bit more than you do. <laughs> well, uh, I, I have one too. An expert is the no one that knows the definition or the exceptions to the rules. Uh, professor alluded to that before. First, you need to know the rules before you know the exceptions, but an expert knows the exceptions to the rules. What's your definition, well, Professor? I just like to Eisenhower repeated a joke that, that he that somebody had told him about an intellectual where he said an intellectual is a man who takes more words than necessary to say more, more than he knows. That's like everybody on the internet now. Um, <laughs> excellent. Okay, um, with your permission, Tony, you got your question in. Jake, Bart, Frank, Erica, jump in. Good. Um, so with your permission, um, I, I just wanna give an outline. Uh, we are going to be talking about the history and laws and cultural exception, acceptance of the LGBTQ community. We are gonna talk abortion and immigration and military and executive orders. We hate them. Well, no, I mean, we love them. Oops, wait, wait, no, we hate them. Uh, we need to go back to Southern monuments and the Confederate flag, the Civil War. Are we still fighting it today? Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. A lot of this stuff happens to be deep-seated feelings about racism and uh, abortion and the rule, was it federal or state? Is it, uh, what is the relationship between the citizen and their government? So some of these will be have elements of repeating. Uh, if you have a topic that you see in, in daily life, something in the news or the, the topic of the day, um, obviously policing is, is something that we'll, we're gonna weave in as well. Please just jot Professor Tootle or I a note or put it on these comments uh, because we intend to make this um, accessible to people. Obviously the way I'm dressing and the professors that are dressing, we're not, we're not giving a big speech with a suit on. We want to talk to real people um, in a real way. And so please invite your friends. Um, that's my concluding remarks for today. We'll go back to rule of law in the future. I, I, friends, I can't tell you how important it is that we shouldn't, when we get really mad at somebody over really important things, guns, um, kids getting killed in schools and us getting killed at concerts and somebody in their faith organization getting killed and we Ban, must ban all guns or no, we don't understand that there's the second amendment and we have to protect ourselves from government and each other. I mean, two diametrically opposed, that doesn't mean we have to hate each other and want to kill each other over those two really deep seated issues of, of guns and abortion and gays and God. And uh, we should figure out how to rationally solve problems with each other, the rule of law. And there's a system for that check out what the written law is, not what my opinion is or the professor's, the written rule of law. Uh, professor, that was my end. What is your end for today's uh, part of the discussion? Just, I appreciate uh, Tony's uh, contribution to the chat there, a freedom talk. I like that, that was, uh, uh, that was good. Uh, and I also just wanna again, thank Tony and John and the participants here, because it is nice that I can do this, that, that you guys enable this to happen. So thank you again to everybody who participates. Awesome. 
All right, we'll see you next Friday at 11. If there's technical problems, it's because Tony's on vacation or, doing, or has a conflicting appointment. So I'm gonna be doing technical as well as uh, answering the professor questions. Please invite your friends to this. Um, thanks again for being here, everyone. Okay, um, I know we're, uh, most folks,